Here we are, back with another episode of the Kayla Ambrose Show. I'm your host and your travel guide to the other side, Kayla Ambrose. As always, you can find out more information about me on my website, exploreyourspirit.com. Sign up there for my free newsletter so we stay in touch and you'll find out about all the things going on. One of the things going on right now is I'm teaching a live class about the Akashic Records. It's a six week class and we're exploring your past lives and going into the Akashic Records and then looking at the present and what you're recording in the Akashic Records. And then at the end of the class, we're gonna to go to the future because time is not the same over on that existence of that plane of existence. So we can look into the future. So that's what, what I'm working on right now with students uh, over in my Academy of Mystical Arts and Spiritual Sciences, where we study all types of things of this nature. I like to say I'm not new age, I'm old age. I teach esoteric wisdom teachings, ancient wisdom teachings. These were taught in ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient India, Further back, Samaria, Mesopotamian times, going all the way back, these, these type of teachings called wisdom teachings or esoteric teachings have been passed from teacher to student. And when I came back this lifetime, I remembered studying in these mystery schools. I remembered being part of the mystery schools, many times as a student, other times as a teacher. And I came back again and found my teachers study with three different teachers to learn the different types. And they kept telling me I was gonna be a teacher in this lifetime. And at first I didn't know if that was really how it was gonna be, but sure enough it did, and that's what I do. If you wanna know what is a mystery school, what type of things do people learn in a mystery school, the easiest way is to get my book, Nine Life-Altering Lessons, Secrets of the Mystery Schools Unveiled. That book shows you the first nine wisdom teachings that I teach to every student who studies with me. It's about going within, transcending from ego and the lower level chakras into your higher self and a connection and a discussion with who you are on a soul level and finding your purpose while you're here. What did you incarnate down onto this earth plane to do and to experience and to share in this lifetime. And that is what I love to teach. But I teach a lot about a lot of other things in the academy, um, how to see auras, how to get psychic, how to understand and connect with the solstices and equinoxes and all the rituals for the changing of the year and the seasons. I teach the wisdom teachings, I teach the Akashic records, I work with a lot of clients and show them everything from seeing future trends to how to grow their business to how to build an online business. And I do intuitive interior design, showing people how to make their home their temple, their sanctuary, their place full of so much good energy that it not only makes a pleasant place for them to live, but it is supportive energy that can hold you and help you as we go through all these transitions. A lot of different hats but they're all the same thing. They're all about intuition and energy and good vibes and how to attune that, whether you're doing it in your home with decorating, where you're doing it from the inside out with your soul, which is where everything should start, whether you're using that wisdom to be of service of to humanity, helping yourself to grow and evolve, understanding why you're here, being a better person just in general, tapping into your gifts and psychic abilities, whatever the reason, it's all many paths, one destination at my website, exploreyourspirit.com. So I hope you'll come check it out, try it out, see if it appeals to you. On today's show, I'm going to do an Ask Kayla question. So if you don't know, you can go on my website, on my contact form, and send in an Ask Kayla question about any topic you'd like me to discuss in a podcast. For this particular question, this was a question that was raised 
by one of my students during the Akashic Records class we were having. And there were some that expressed interest in knowing more. And I said, okay, I don't have the time to discuss it in this class, but I will answer it in a podcast. So here goes. The question is, can you tell me more about what is a star seed and how does that connect to aliens? And what is, what is um, some of the history there with aliens? Huge topic. I can't cover all of it in one little podcast, but this could be the start of many uh, forthcoming podcasts where I will talk more about alien life, alien theories, other civilizations, and what that means for us. So for today, we're going to delve in a little bit on the star seeds. Now, remember I said, I'm not new age, I'm old age. I teach the ancient wisdom teachings. There are a lot of new agers out there that are sharing some information and it can get a little scattered. And sometimes they know part of the information, but haven't studied at the deeper level or looked into the history and the research. So I advise you to look deeper whenever you're learning something online or from anyone, myself included. If you read the first page of my nine life altering lessons book, I say, even while you're reading this, you don't believe what I say. Verify for yourself. Go within and see if it feels right. This is now more important than ever to verify things, do your research, and see what rings true to you. So I'm going to share with you what I know and what I was taught, but in no way am I trying to convince you. Okay, so star seed. Some say that word star seed actually came from a book that Brad Steiger wrote. Now, you, if you've listened to my podcast, you've heard me tell a story about Brad Steiger before. He's an amazing author and researcher, wrote over 170 some books in his lifetime, and he's been wonderful to me. He's endorsed many of my books. I used to have him on my podcast years ago to talk about a lot of his books. Just an amazing, amazing man. In 1976, I think, one of his books he wrote was called The Gods of Aquarius. And in it, he mentions star seeds where there were beings from other planets who then incarnated into uh, the human race. And so that's where a lot of people say the actual term starseed was incorporated. The stories about starseeds, though, whatever you want to call them, come from way, way back. They were shared in ancient Egypt. They were shared in many stories of how different gods came to be. The one I find the most interesting, though, is the Dogon tribe from North Africa. And when researchers found this tribe, they had not really been exposed to other cultures. And they kind of lived in their, you know, in their little world in that section of North Africa. This is going back several decades now, many decades, before the internet, before any of that. But these people just didn't really have a lot of interaction with other people. And yet they could give an entire accounting of our solar system. They explained to all these researchers and scientists where the planets were, um, what our entire solar system looked like, the galaxy, how things worked. They would even point to constellations in the sky and they pointed to where Cirrus was and said, this is where we came from. This is where the star people came from. This is where people still come to visit us. And so they talked about alien visitors and experiences in this way and that that story out of all of them is so intriguing to me because it's a group of people that knew all of this so well and had such a great accounting of it and are here still to to recount it we could read about the same recountings in egypt and other cultures like that but the people there today don't have that recollection the same way the people that are living in Egypt today but these tribes do they have the stories that were passed down and kept identical and so from a historic perspective that's really interesting right so we got the star people now called star seeds all of these um, groups and lots of other indigenous native tribes as well 
say we came from the stars and basically we're probably all alien when you think about it depending on how the earth was when it was first formed and what formed here there's probably a lot of alien life that came here in one form or another that intersected with earth and how things were done there are so many stories of this okay so we're just going there today with all this talk aliens and what like so let me just go there Zachariah Stitchin if you haven't heard of him write his name down he wrote a lot of books one of them is called the 12th planet now he did a lot of research of this into alien races and his theories of what happened here on earth fascinating reads lots of books of his to read he passed away I think a couple years ago he talks about the 12th planet which is in the rotation of our planets here but it is on such a different longer rotation that it only comes around where we can see it around the sun in our part here um, where we can see it from earth about every 3600 years and when it does there's an alien race that lives on that planet and they come to earth to visit when they're here so he talks about them I think he calls them the Anunnaki Anunnaki maybe Anunnaki there are much um, other scholarly people that know that know much more details about this than I do I'm giving you a quick overview but the Anunnaki and I think he says they're first notated in our history around the time of the Sumerians now that's going way back in time that's going way before even ancient Egypt that's way back going into Mesopotamia Sumerian times um, way back you know Babylon way back back and there's stories there that are still preserved and still can be found that historians look at many of those stories that were told in Sumerian times have been passed down for so long that as other cultures then would meet these elders these people from these groups some of other humans would be captured by these people uh, held as slaves some in became just merged part of that group they would hear these stories that were passed down one of them was the story of a great flood on earth now when i say the great flood i'm not talking about the time in noah and the ark that is actually a story that had to do with a localized flood the story of noah and again without going too much off topic here um, that's a story for another day but research has shown that that flood that was recorded around the time of noah was actually just a localized flood in that area and i could say a lot more about that but the jewish people that were recording those stories had learned these stories from other people they had been around because they were very uh, nomadic at that time and moved around and learned stories from much older civilizations and they had heard the story of the great flood so they created that as a parable trying to teach their nomadic tribes things about morals and parables and things to do and good versus bad so they used the story of a localized flood and blew it up into something bigger and the original story came from a much older time where geologists and scientists have shown that there was a great flood much much thousands of years earlier than what someone would call the time of noah and in these stories there are many reports of the anunnaki an alien race who came to earth and they used humans that were here as slaves they wanted to mine gold they needed gold for something to do with their planet or spaceships or whatever they had a need for it and so gold was the most important thing they had found on earth and so they were using all these different equipment and things trying to mine the gold but it was really found that humans were the the right size and the right tool to really get in there and mine that gold so as the stories go there was some genetic engineering done on humanity 
and some splicing done and parts of our DNA were moved around. So in some ways it made us more intelligent on the earth plane to communicate with each other in order to get work done. But other things were put in there as well that stopped some of our other things that would have evolved at the same time. Our ability to be more telepathic, our ability to create things on a faster level. Some of the more what we might call magical things were messed with as well to keep us from not being as strong as we were supposed to be. There's a lot of theories about this of how and why we were created. Were we a great experiment? Were we to see what just a creature could do that was made and then had free will? How long would it take us to evolve? What would we do with it? And so it was considered that they kind of messed with our evolution and were messing with it by continuing to do this and enslave us and have us mine for gold. And so eventually that attention was caught by other alien races who came and said, hey, this is not part of the deal here. There was a prime directive that Earth was going to be left alone to see how these people would turn out doing whatever they wanted to do with free will. It's an experiment to see how they would grow and evolve. So you're not supposed to be messing with them. But by that time, the damage was done and people were suffering a lot because their evolution had been uh, changed with a radical jump. And so their stories then of in ancient Egypt of this alien god called Thoth who came and kind of showed things about light and fire and heat and also how to write and communicate and put things down on paper or papyrus at the time and how to keep records of things because they felt that now that we had been spliced in this way which in science many people refer to as the missing link how we went from being kind of Neanderthals with not using a lot of our brain, not really, uh, you know, living the kind of existence we are now. Where was that missing link where we kind of went from Neanderthal to Homo sapiens, as we're called now? And what made that genetic leap? And, and that's the missing link they're always looking for. So this is what Zachariah Stitchin and some others like him poses that theory that there was an alien intervention with genetic uh, engineering done there. So at that point, then some of the other aliens came in to kind of help us a little bit to not see us suffer. And since the directive had kind of been taken over at that point by some not nice aliens trying to do things to us like that, um, they tried to give us some helpful things so that we could at least have a few things to work with while we continued on our evolution. And they kind of told the other things to stay away. So the story goes that there are some races now of aliens who kind of protect this area, who put a, a force field around it, and a grid that would keep others from being able to come through uh, to do that type of thing again. And many people talk about this is why gold is considered still so important that we have the gold standard that even our money not now but used to be was all by how much gold we had in the gold standard while gold is nice it's a nice metal it melts fairly easy it certainly can be used for things there's not really a true explanation if you ask someone why is gold considered the most precious metal over other metals there's there's not really why it should be worth more and so Many researchers say it goes back to that being impressed in our DNA that this was the most important thing. They also say there were things impressed in our DNA at that time that we were to look upon a being in the sky as being greater than us, our creator, and that we were to have fear uh, if that creator was ever angry at us or if we did something that that creator didn't like, that we would be punished. And we could be punished eternally, or we could be punished severely here on earth, even with the earth being 
destroyed or flooded or, or by fire, all types of things. And so there was a fear imprinted in us with the genetic engineering that the things that came out of the sky or the being that lived in the sky was greater, powerful, all-knowing, knew if we were going to be bad, even if we weren't saying it, would know everything about us, was omnipotent, and could come back and punish us at any time. And so we better be good. So I'll leave you to think about that, how that could have been impressed into all of our DNA, and then how those stories have trickled down into other stories that we call religion or dogma and where that originally came from. And are we to continue to feel that way? That's a whole other conversation for another day. So let me get back to star seeds. So star seeds are souls who've evolved past humanity. They're beings who choose to come back to inspire and to help humanity evolve. They're trying to help humanity get off the will of karma in advance. And they incarnate willingly. They come back down here and they want to help. But the thing is, when you sign up to incarnate into a human experience, you are dropping down on the evolutionary plane. You are dropping from a higher vibration into a lower dense vibration to live here on the earth plane. So because of that, you have some amnesia, forgetfulness. I don't know what word I would use. You're not able to reach all the parts of your brain that you used to with the knowledge that you have. So you don't always remember your past lives or who you are. It has to be awakened again. So many of these star seeds, when they come down here, they forget who they are. And it has to be triggered in some way where they remember they're here to serve humanity and to help and to take part. If you're wondering, are you part of a star seed? Here's some generic and general tips that show that you might be one. First, you might really be a person who's willing to introspect deeply. You want to know all the reasons why. You look deeply at everything in life and you want to know why all of it happens like it happens. And you're drawn to things like mystery schools and wisdom teachings and esoteric wisdom and ancient mysteries and hidden mysteries and ancient Egypt and Atlantis and Lemuria, all those things. You know these things are true. Second, you often have a feeling that you want to go home. And you know that Earth is not really your home. And you don't really know why you don't fit in with humanity and why you don't get the things that some of humanity gets. You just know you don't quite belong. And this probably has been this way your whole life since childhood. You are more em empathetic, you are an empath, you are psychic, and as a child you were probably drawn to magic. You were drawn to reading about Egypt and Atlantis or mythology and studying things like about witches and fairies and the pyramids and all kinds of metaphysics. And even as you wanted to go home and you knew you didn't quite belong here, you also struggled a lot here. It wasn't easy to understand the other children or adults. You're an old soul, you feel like. And sometimes you'd rather be alone than be with people who are acting from their lower level vibrations. People that are making fun of other people are angry or bullying or just being mean for no reason are just too much in the lower level stuff. You don't want to drift down there and be that. And you don't understand why they hurt each other and why they hurt themselves. You don't understand why they would take drugs. You know that there's no reason to take drugs. To reach the higher planes, to reach communication with the other side, you know that you have to be in your purest state and in a clean state. And that using drugs won't get you there. You don't understand why they drink. You don't understand why they, why they do so many things to stop from being awake or aware or to sort through their feelings and go deeper. It's hard to understand why these people don't want to grow or evolve. 
and why they don't self-introspect or even self-improve. Those who spend their life avoiding these things, they live in fear and, and in their very basic ways. They're focused completely on their physicality and their physical looks and don't really explore the depths of their mind or their spirituality or their emotions. In fact, they usually try to block or run away from them. Star seeds don't do that. They want to go deep. They want to, exp to explore. They're hugely intuitive and empathetic and want to help. They know they're here for a purpose. They know their purpose is to help the world and they never feel content until they can align with that purpose and do what they're here to do. Other things about star seeds, medical procedures never really work quite the same for them and medicines don't work the same way either. They can have strong reactions to a medicine that for everyone else would be fine, but for them it makes things go haywire. They may not always be the best in school either. They're not your straight A students, unless metaphysics was a, a degree you could get in traditional colleges. If that was the case, they would knock it out of the park. They would graduate with honors. They are very likable and while they struggle with that in their childhood, in their adult years, they become very likable, but they find very few people that they can trust and really communicate deeply with where the people honor that trust and hold it to that level. It's said that Star Seas also went on to have children here. And some of those are the indigos and those are some of their children that were born that first incarnation that uh, were aligned with the sixth chakra, so that indigo color. And these children were born to be warriors. They were born to break barriers. They were here for social justice and to clear paths. And they're kind of edgy. They're edgy in their actions and the way they dress and their style. They're, they're warriors. And then the next incarnation generation of children from that are the crystal children. And that's coming from the crown chakra. And they're here to operate from a high frequency, to have an open heart and to be healers and just to help attune the frequency and raise the vibration here for humanity. And then the next generation after that are the rainbow children, which are here to bring everyone together and to expand the spectrum of understanding humanity at all the different levels and incarnations and to widen that uh, spectrum. So those are the three that are kind of working in tandem, the different generations there and, and what their roles are. Some say that star seeds are traveling souls, that um, they often live parallel lives. They're not just living in one lifetime, they're living in multi. And you know, if you listen to my podcast on the Akashic Records, that's what I'm teaching about right now is how we live parallel lives, the multiverse, how we're living many lifetimes in, in one. And star seeds are recognized by being very sensitive, as empaths are sensitive, psychically sensitive. Their emotions, you know, are easily hurt. It's things that other humans can kind of laugh at. Very difficult for star seeds. To watch anyone in pain or suffering, it's not considered funny. They're here to help Earth and be in service of humanity. They're telepathic. They know they have a, a, a destiny here, but at the same time, it feels hard to be here. And that's because they're used to living in a higher vibration. So it's like being in, in quicksand down here. Everything's slow and more work and harder to do. Star seeds are multidimensional. They can be on the earth plane sometimes and astral travel and be in the other planes. They know they're on a mission, like I said. They're good at having out-of-body experiences. They're spiritual, but they're not religious. You won't see them attached to a certain religion or dogma. They love to read, especially about fantasy. Uh, like I said, anything to do with fairies and witches and magical beings, magical places. They long to find others like them and to find their tribe, even though 
that's not the purpose of being here is to find your tribe and to go all live together in harmony they're actually here to help and to do work and that means usually more alone time away from like-minded others they're often affected by electronics and electronics are affected by them their aura can short out the electronics or affect them in that way those are some of the descriptions that are used for star seeds now i want to just try to explain a little bit what i think know and feel about star seeds so most humans have in their dna some type of star seed energy when these star seeds came from long 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 time ago to help after the original group of aliens came and did that DNA splicing, the Anunnaki that I talked about. Star seeds came, and many of them were said to be down here with humans and have relationships with them. So their DNA got mixed into our DNA. So a lot of people have that mixed in. So there's those, those type of star seeds where that's what the indigenous tribes are explaining, that we all come from the stars, and we all kind of mixed in from that. So we all have part of that in us. And then there are others that are directly incarnating, meaning they have been incarnating on other planets, not just in the human incarnations. And this can mean several things. One... Some humans have done the work and incarnated and evolved that they now don't come back as human souls. They've gone on to incarnate as other species and in other ways. And as they're evolved, they're going to different planets and different places, let's call it for now, planes of existence. And they decide to come back to help humanity because we're all trying to help humanity evolve and get off this will of karma that's going on here. So they choose willingly to come back as a soul and drop into a human body, not having a human soul, and to take part that way. These were humans and then evolved beyond that to the next level and they're coming back. So they remember a lot of, of humanity. And there are some other star seeds that haven't been human, but have a direct interest in wanting to help, who also will come back and take a human form in order to help humanity and to be part here. What do both of these types have in common with each other? That, well, the thing is, these star seeds don't run around telling you they're star seeds. They're not running around screaming, I'm a star seed, I'm a star seed, I'm special, I'm here to do this or that. They just get on with their work. Whatever they're here to do, they get on with it and they do it. And they help and serve humanity in whatever way they do. And it's not all by teaching metaphysics things, though some of them do. They choose all types of ways to be of service where they can engage with people. So they could be in any industry you know. The guy who runs, you know, your favorite restaurant might be one. And he serves people through making incredible food and gathering people together in that restaurant for them to have special experiences and, and moments. And his food is so good, it delights everyone and makes them happy. He could be doing it in that way. I'm a huge fan of Dan Millman, who wrote the Peaceful Warrior book. If you haven't read that book, it's great. And I have used to have Dan Millman on my podcast, uh, The Explorer Spirit with Kayla Show, to talk about his books and his work. And if you've read that book, he talks about Socrates, the man he met that he studied with. And Socrates ran a gas station, which was called a service station. And that's where Dan Millman would go to have his talks with him. So... He was being of service to humanity at that gas station, at that service station, for those that were ready to hear and affecting their lives every day in certain ways. 
So to be a star seed, you'll find that they go about their work. They're not chasing fame and they're definitely not running around saying that they're a star seed. They don't go around either saying that they're some kind of super master, super better than everything or everyone. That's just not their way or not the way they're going to talk about this at all. They can come from different areas as well. Many of the native tribes talked about the Pleiades and the star woman that came from that area. And Pleiadians are discussed a lot with the sisters there, the seven sisters. Pleiadians are known to be loving and they really want to make other people happy. They're basically embodying divine feminine energy and they want to help people heal. Their heart chakra is where they come from and they're just full of love. They're not the strongest warriors um, because they're full of so much love and empathy. But there's a lot of Pleiadian star seeds here that are trying to help and to do that work. Another one comes from Cirrus, the Syrians as they're called. And they're trying to teach how to be in touch with your power and how to open up. They're very focused on teaching this so that it doesn't go awry. It said they watched what happened in Atlantis and Samaria and ancient Egypt. They were very much engaged at those times. And they're often notated by people that like water and mermaids and dolphins. But they saw how power corrupts too, like how things went awry in Atlantis and how cultures can get too aggressive. So they're here to try to teach us about having a more spiritual connection to power and not using it just uh, wealth for domination or power over other people. They're doing their best to do that in a third dimensional world when they understand that everything's created in the higher dimensions. So they're very eager for us to get to the fifth dimension world where we can start to create more with our thoughts, more with stepping into our power and just seeing it into being rather than being this low vibration where we think currently like you have to have power by holding it over other people, which is such a low level way of thinking. There's also those from Andromeda and they're here to show about freedom, about not being tied down, not believing something just because it's said to you, not just because it's always been the rules. They're here to help you think about the rules and do they really have a point or are they just here to control? They're, they're here to help us find freedom and, and to release in that way. They're very telepathic. And it said the Andromedians, and Andromeda, Andromedians, <laughs> Andromeda, whichever way they're called, that they came here after what that race of aliens called the reptilians came here. And that they were trying to control us as well. And they stepped in saying, no, we've, you know, after we caught what happened originally, we're not allowing any races to do anything. And so they put a stop to them, stopped the enslavement that was going on. There are light workers, and light workers are souls from human, you know, uh, realms, just the higher realms, and some from other planets as well. And they come here to Earth to help it evolve. They want to help humanity kind of level up, go to the next thing, and they're here to help raise the consciousness of everyone so that all of us can be free from this lower level vibration planet that we're on. We're supposed to be raising up and going to the next level. Lightworkers don't really belong to any particular planet or race or group. They're souls from all different walks who are here with the same purpose, to work solely to help bring in light and love and kindness and goodness and mainly love and just to help it grow and evolve in that way. There are the Arcturians. 
and this is considered one of the most advanced civilizations in our galaxy. They're pretty much fifth dimensional beings, it said. They came to Earth to try to help build some schematics to show how to evolve here. They try to stay out of the way. They're so much more intellectually advanced that when we receive even information from them, it takes a while for our brains to even absorb it and to break it down to understand it at the level in which we use our brain. But they came and taught a lot about healing and they communicate directly with some people here, kind of beaming their energy and information telepathically to them. Those are some of the most common alien races that you'll hear talk about. Uh, the greys as well, which would be the ones most recently that you hear people talking about. That started really in the 20th century in the 1900s, where you'd hear stories of alien abductions and things with the greys that went on starting around World War II. There are so many alien races. One day it'll be funny to look back and talk about when people believed that there were no aliens, that really out of all the galaxies and all the planets, which no one even knows how far that goes, that there, that there was never any other life, that out of all the places in the world, there was only life on Earth, without even considering that we're functioning here in third dimension. So even if a rover lands on one of the planets here local to us, and they don't immediately see signs of life, they're looking in third dimension as well. We don't know what life is like in the fifth, sixth, or seventh dimension, where we're less corporeal in uh, physicality, but exist as consciousness. We could be very well training that camera from that rover onto a being of consciousness and not even knowing how to see it or uh, to visualize it or understand it there because it's not in a 3D body like we would understand. So there's so much more to learn in this way. For the sake of this podcast, and I've gone way over time, like I said, it's such a huge topic to try to discuss. There are a lot of alien races and with different means uh, and abilities to communicate and different ideas about what they wanted to do with us and communicate with us. And we're just barely stepping into that now, getting ready to explore space on a, on a deeper level and put ourselves out there and see where that takes us. We now have entered that next point of evolution where we're going to grow. And I think it's going to be very exciting. Everything we learn will just help us advance in one form or another. But as a star seed, whether it's way back in your evolution, like when you when you look at your DNA and you do the test, you might see there's a part in there if you could if testing could be done for alien DNA, which it might in the future, and so many people will find out what planets uh, they're partially incarnated from. So you may have part of it in you from way back, and you may remember that in your past lives even though you're incarnating now as a human. You may be one who directly came, not even being in the human rotation anymore. Or you may be a human who got the first chance to go rotate and then wanted to come back and help humanity. Any of those, if you are, you know, you feel it. You you feel you're calling for a purpose and a destiny. And you don't feel the need to shout it to others or to try to be famous for it or anything like that. You just feel the need to serve humanity. You want to do good works. You want to be of help. And the thing I think that gets mi mixed up with all the New Age teachings is somehow those tend to appeal to the lower chakras and to the ego and make you think you're supposed to say that you're something special. When star seeds know every person is unique, every person is special, every person is important and that each human provides something wonderful and amazing and important to this world and so we're here to help every single person and to do whatever needs to be done to be 
of service to humanity. And so each person stands up to do that, whether they're human, whether they're a starseed, whether they're a hybrid. All of us are here to do our part and to help and to make the world a better place. And starseeds do it just the same. And what's confusing with New Age, too, is the belief, well, if you find out that you are that or that resonates with you and you think that you are, that somehow you then have to do it in only a metaphysical way. And again, let me say, we, it's needed in every type of work. To be empathic and intuitive and loving and kind, all the things that star seeds embody, that's needed in healthcare. It's needed in the law. It's needed in prisons. It's needed in teaching. It's needed in restaurants. It's needed in daycares. It's needed in every walk of life, tending to the gardens, landscaping, building things, making homes safe and good, making products that are healthy and safe and good. Anything you can imagine, any job in the world, IT, keep going, just throw them out. Star seeds are needed to do every one of those jobs to make sure it's the best that it can be, that it will help and heal and care and lift the energy. So it's not about finding a certain only, one only vocation. It's about doing whatever you want to do, but doing it with that purpose in mind to lift and to care and to make the world better wherever it is. If your job, you know, if you were here hundreds of years ago and your job was to go to the river every day and get pails of water and bring the water back to the home so the family could have it, and every day as you sloshed with those buckets, you were blessing the water and you were thanking the river for the water, and as the bucket sloshed, you were saying, hi, grass, and I walk along this path, enjoy this water as it sloshes, and you were willing the grass to grow and be happy and that flowers would grow there to be beautiful on the path for people to walk there and then you were blessing the water and you got home and saying may this water nurture the family as they drink from it and cook from it and bathe in it and that's all you did that is helping and being in service there is no job too small no job too big we need more star seeds that are ceos more star seeds and Certainly in other places where it would make a difference, like banking and wealth and everything you can consider. So don't let the thought of being something like that make you think there's only one way to, to do it, such as doing psychic readings or something. It is whichever calls to you. It's a way of being, not a way of doing. Work is what you do. But the energy that comes from within you is what you are being. And this is where we are now. We are in the age of being, not doing. Not about what title do you have, but who be you? Who are you and why are you here? And those are the age old questions. Who am I? What is my purpose? What is my reason for being here, for being born at this time? What can I do to be of service? If you focus and go inside and ask yourself those questions, you'll find out the rest. It will be revealed to you if you're a star seed or have any of that other energy and you will receive the calling and the nudges and the things to do. You'll know them. They'll feel right. You'll get the goosebumps. You'll feel the tingles when you're doing the right thing. And it's in any way that makes someone's life better or enriches it at all. Okay, well, I went way over today with this podcast, but I hope this information was interesting and helpful to you, and I'll see you next week.